Let's turn our Bibles to book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 16 through 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 23. The title of the message is Dangers of Christians. Dangers of Christians. Dangers of Christians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 16 through 23. The Bible says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Richard, can you please pray for the message? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for another day here, Lord, that we get to come to a Bible-believing church that preaches directly from the King James Bible. Father God, we pray that you please fill Pastor Jay with your Holy Spirit. Anoint him, Lord God. Please speak through him so that we may hear the message that we need to hear. Help us to clear our heart and our mind that we may be pricked by the sermon, that we may be moved to be better Christians for you in this God-forsaken world. Lord, we thank you for our free gift of eternal salvation through Lord Jesus Christ. Through your precious blood that you shed on the cross at Calvary, that atones for all of our sins, Lord. Thank you that it's not by works. Thank you that it's only by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ for what you did. Thank you, Father, for the love and the compassion that you showed on to us. Lord, we pray that while we're here on this earth, Lord, we, we have the courage and the boldness provided by you, Lord, that we may go out there and preach the gospel Amen. unto all the sinners that are on their way to hell, Lord. There's nothing that, that they need more than that, Lord. And please convict our hearts so that we may do your will, Lord God. Help us to abide in your will, to have virtue, understanding, knowledge, and wisdom through your word. Help us to diligently Seek you, Father God, and to constantly read the Bible, Lord, and to have constant fellowship with you, so that way we may uh, be holy unto you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to have the fear of you, the Lord God, so that we may uh, abstain from all appearance of evil, Lord. Father God, we pray that for any of the brothers and sisters that's not here today, Lord, for whatever reason, Lord God, we pray that you please fill them with the Holy Spirit, comfort them, Lord, tend to their prayer needs accordingly uh -huh. to your will, Lord, and so that we may so that we may gather again together here at church, Lord, so that we may serve you as a whole congregation, Amen. Lord. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this day. We pray for your soon return. Even so come, Lord Jesus. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Dangers of Christians. You know, we deal with a lot of dangerous things on a daily basis. You know, if you're driving in Southern California, you're always facing danger. You have a lot of crazy drivers out there. And since the legalization of marijuana, you have more people under the influence, you know, driving. Yes. And obviously, you see a lot of people drunk driving as well. Without the protection from God, you know, you and I will be hurt many times. Now, how many close calls have you had, you know, as you're driving here and as you've been driving anywhere, you know? And as a Christian, you and I have to be aware of dangers that we face. And you and I have to be aware of certain dangers in order to grow as a Christian. Because if you just live, you know, blindly or in a naive sense, what happens when devil attacks? You just don't know. 
And when devil constantly attacks you, you fall into defeat constantly. And last thing we want to become is a defeated Christian. A lot of times the saddest thing to see a Christian become is a defeated Christian. Who wants to be called a loser, right? You know, I think one of the you know, worst name calling is calling anybody a loser, right? You're a loser, you know, as a man, you know, you're a loser as a father, you know, you're a loser as a whatever sport that you're playing. And obviously, you know, you're a loser as a mom, you're a loser as a grandma, grandpa. I think those are terms that you just don't want to hear. And especially if you're a very competitive person, especially if you love to play sports, you really don't want to be called a loser. Right? And you don't want to be in a losing team. I mean, who wants to be on a losing team? Even if it's like a school, you know, just PE time, there's no official records being kept. But who wants to be on a losing team? Even if you're playing a soccer, you're playing handball, you're playing kickball. I mean, do you want to be on a losing team? Obviously not. And defeated Christians don't realize that they're always losing. And part of the reason is that obviously, you know, we have very common reasons. You know, you don't have fear of God. You don't read the Bible. You don't pray. The basic things that you have to do as a Christian. However, there are certain things that is a great danger to Christians. And number one thing that you don't have to worry about is burning in hell. Amen. But, you know, people always are in danger of not knowing where they're going. What does that mean? They don't have assurance of salvation. Why? Because they listen to different teachings. They fall into different doctrines. But as a Bible-believing Christian that you profess yourself to be, you never have to worry about danger of burning in hell. Amen. And that's once and for all. I mean, let's look at verse 23, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body is preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We already see three parts in a human being. You have body, you have soul, and you have spirit. When you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your body and soul separated forever. And we call that spiritual circumcision, according to Colossians 2.11. That means that no matter what happens to your body, your soul is now clean, white as snow, washed I mean, by blood of Jesus Christ. All your sins once and for all. So you never have to worry about burning in hell. Why? Because you cannot, in a spiritual sense, you cannot sin anymore. Your body and soul separated. Obviously, you know, until the day of redemption, until your body gets saved, when the Lord comes back, especially for Christians, day of rapture, until that day comes, until your body and my body gets the true salvation, we're still going to commit sin. Yes. That's why the Bible says in first. John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. So we do have to live a life that is according to the word of God. You know, after you get saved, can you live like the devil? You could, sure. but does God want you to? Never, God right? You know, why is it that people think that after they get saved, all those you know, commandments, right? The laws don't apply to them anymore. As far as salvation is concerned, it doesn't. But they're there for a reason. Yes. They made you and me realize that we're sinners. Yes. And they're good for you. And you should obey them. Amen. No matter what, right? I mean, just Ten Commandments alone, you know, you need to obey. Yes. I mean, you can't have, <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to steal? No. I mean, and then you're going to be like, oh, since I'm safe, I could steal. And I could live like however I want. I mean, according to Romans 8.13, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. You know? I mean, go to Galatians chapter 6. You, know, you reap what you sow. So you don't have danger of burning in hell, but you have danger 
of getting fellow, I mean, getting out of fellowship, Lord Jesus Christ. You have danger of becoming a defeated Christian, and you have danger of becoming sorry Christian. You know, people always say, you know, I've never been, Pastor Shrive always said, right? I've never been sorry that I became a Christian, but I've been a sorry Christian many times. Man, I mean, we do, right? We do many, many stupid things, sinful things. But however, that shouldn't be the norm. You know, you shouldn't be like every day, you know what, I committed sin today. That's just me. And I'm just a sinner. I'm just a loser, you know. I mean, you know, some people, they don't want to say loser about anything else. But when it comes to Christian life, they don't mind. They're like, you know what, I'm a loser, Christian. Uh, how, what a, that's not a big deal, right? I mean, it is a huge deal. It should be the biggest deal in your life. If you constantly, you know, have a self-pity and thinking that, you know, I was given a, you know, wrong card in my life. That's why I'm going to live a defeated Christian life. You have to think again. There are many, many Christians out there who's worse than you. I mean, people have, they're born with like uh, immune diseases. They can't even see the sunlight. They can't even breathe the air like normal people do. They can't touch anything. If someone touches them, they get infected. You're not in that state, right? Some people are born where they can't even walk. Some people can't even see. Some people can't even hear. Some people can't even taste. So as far as what I see and what I'm concerned, you and I are more than blessed to do something for God. Yes. You and I are more than blessed to you know, live a victorious Christian life. Then, what are something that's really a danger to a Christian? Number one, distraction. Distractions are danger to Christians. Let's go to book of Luke, Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. We're going to look at parable of sower. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. And this is dealing with, you know, kingdom of God mystery. Luke chapter 8. And we're going to concentrate on verses 7 and 14, specifically for saved Christians. You know, some people think that these people aren't saved, but these are saved people. We'll look at it. Why? Let's look at Luke chapter 8, verse 7. The Bible says, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. So we call it a choked heart, right? But look at verse 6 behind it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. We call that a shallow heart. Shallow heart people aren't saved people. They're people who's almost at the finish line. Literally, they hear the gospel, they hear about Jesus Christ, but they don't accept him as their Lord and Savior. They don't trust the blood atonement and receive Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. That's a sick case, right? Yes. But let's look at verse 7. This is, it talks about a lot of you and me. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Choked heart. You know, if you see, if you hear a lot of fundamentalists, people who don't know the Bible, they say, these people aren't saved. You know what? Let's look at verse 14. And that which fell among thorns are they, which when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. What happened is that they had roots. You know, they accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. And some of them were gung-ho about serving the Lord. Many of you, after you've gotten saved, you receive new life, you are, you're gung-ho. You're telling everybody, your best friends, your family, your mom, your dad, your grandma, grandpa, your cousins, everyone that you know, because you just got saved from hell. You have this good news, gospel of Jesus Christ. You want everyone to get saved. So you were really, really gung-ho. You were zealous. However, what happened? Cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. You got to have roots. The fact that you could bear fruit just tells you that you're already saved, right? If you're not saved, you can't bear no fruit here, right? right? Yeah. So, again, doctrinally speaking, we're talking about saved people here. So what happened? The cares of this world, all this distraction in this world, 
have choked this person away, choked their heart away. This is the biggest danger that Christians have nowadays. Amen. Cares of this world, right? Yes. Your pursuit of wealth. How many people let the pursuit of wealth get in the way of serving the Lord? I mean, that's like a huge thing. Why do people split nowadays? Number one reason, besides from, you know, infidelity, is because of financial problems. Yes. People cannot accept God providing their need. People need to have all the ones in the world. Lord, where's my mansion? You say you provide me mansion, so they take it out of context, right? You know, there are many mansions in heaven for you, right? But you're like, here, here on earth, Lord, Beverly Hills, that should be my address. And it shouldn't be, you know, one of those, you know, cheap places. It should be those mansions, you know, amongst, you know, all those Hollywood celebrities, right? And you're like, Lord, you know, what's with all these possessions that I have? I don't have name brands. Uh -huh. And children say that a lot to their parents. I mean, shame on you if you do that. Mommy, daddy, you know, like Johnny over there, you know, Jane over there, they, are, they all have this brand name. Where's mine, right? I mean, that's a shameful way to treat your parents. That's very uh, unthankful child. Yes. You should be thankful as a Christian young man and young woman, Christian boy and girls, that you actually have parents who's saved and providing your need. That's all you need. Amen. Why do you always have to look for these pleasures of this life? You know, this life is like a vapor, right? That appear for a little time. Absolutely. You make this cares of everything that's going on in your life be a distraction. That's why you have to look at your life right now, Christian. Are you really close to the Lord? I mean, do you have any type of fellowship with the Lord? I mean, it's very important that you have fellowship because that's the most important thing in your life, having fellowship with Lord Jesus Christ, because that will set a foundation for everything else. But because there are so many distractions, because your pursuit of, you know, Wealth, material things have taken priority over Lord Jesus Christ. That's all you're doing, right? Even right now, some folks, all you're thinking about is your career. Some folks, all you're thinking about is your stocks. You know, some folks, all you're thinking about is your business. Some folks, all you're thinking about is your bank account. Some folks, all you're thinking about, how can I, what do I need to do to grow my wealth? I mean, we live in a society, if you don't have something that some people have, you're ostracized, you become a leper, right? Literally. I mean, I'm glad I don't go to school nowadays. It's, it's gotten so worse, right? Yes. Because of advancement of technology. Like, oh yeah, you know, David over there, you know, has the latest iPhone, you know, but... You know, Johnny over there only has the previous model, you know. We're only going to hang out with David because this guy is like half months, half year you old, right? And kids see it and go through it. Then as parents at home, you have to cleanse them. You have to cleanse them through the Word of God. Amen. Because not everybody has luxury of raising their kids, you know, closely like in a homeschool. Yes. You know, people have to work. So your children are going to public school, and I mean, we don't have to get into gender identity and all those stuff, right? One of the biggest distractions out there. And your kids will bring distraction to your home. Then as a parent, you have to do something about it. I mean, are you gonna be like, ah, let's not talk about it, right? Just abstain from all appearance of evil. <laughs> and you don't explain anything. You know, the kids over there, you can't expect them to just read the Word of God and understand everything. You and I can't even do that. I mean, they need a lot of explanation. Yes. And as they go through so much distraction in this world, as parents, as teachers, you have to do your job as a person in authority. You have to explain to them what's wrong with gender identity issue. You have to explain to them what's wrong with people always wanting things, right? You have to explain to them 
about all the ungrateful things that kids say, all the wicked stuff that comes out of their mouth. And what happens is that if you don't deal with it, what they say and what they bring to you from the world, all the cares of the world, you partake in their distraction. Oh, man, my kid, you know, is not going to school and getting off on, you know, Lamborghini and Ferrari, you know. Man, so I better step up my game. I got to do everything I can to, you know, buy those luxury cars. What's this? Do you live your life for your kids? Or do you live your life to please the Lord? Sometimes distractions become, well, your children become your distraction of serving the Lord. You know, a lot of, every culture nowadays, I see it. You know, they, parents live their life through their children. Yeah. You know what? You don't go to Harvard. You don't go to Ivy League school. Man, I can't talk to you anymore. Right? I mean, what is your SAT score? You know? What? Only this? Oh, better get into the room. Street preaching? No way. Visitation? No way. Church? Ah, no. Man, they're not that important. How many of you children? Don't raise your hand, okay? How many children have you heard that from your parents, right? You know? You're doing your best. Your best is what you are. And that's all God wants. Right? Your best is, I don't know, SAT score is like, I don't know, I mean, 80% of the perfect score, right? That's all you could do. At school, you do your best. You know? You're only getting like 4.2, but your parents want you to get 4.6, right? And like, oh, that's all you do. And then you tell your parents, ah, you know what, I'm doing my best. You know, in front of God, I'm doing my best. Your parents said, no, 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 no. No way. You know, you're an embarrassment to our family because I can't talk about you in front of other people because their children have a higher GPA, their children have, you know, higher SAT score, and their children have, you know, some stupid extracurricular activities, you know. <laughs> I mean, you have to understand, if you are saved, everything that happens in your life Right? It's according to God's plan. Yes. You could have 7.5 GPA. If God doesn't want you to go to Harvard, you can't get in. Yeah. I mean, you could score like perfect SAT score, but God says that's not for you, then you don't go. Yeah. Then at the end of the day, you know what people do? They start blaming the church. They're like, wow. So children were your distraction. Cares of this world were your distraction. Now church becomes your distraction. Man, if any of you think that church is your distraction, I mean, get out of here. I mean, don't stay here. I mean, our church should never be your distraction. Go to a place where you think church could be your distraction and you could live your worldly life. But Bible-believing church should never be your distraction. It should be your blessing. Right? You can't be like, you know what? Our church does too much, you know, street ministry. You don't want people to get saved, right? You know, our church are too strong on the standing of King James Bible. What? What what do you want? You want to use the devil's Bible, right? You know, our church is too strict on all the rules and regulations and everything. What? You want chaos, right? Right. Do you want what happened to Israelites, you know, after Moses came back to happen? No. I mean, you want, like, all the pleasures of this world and this life and riches, that's all you want. Have you ever thought about what Lord had to go through? And Lord, Lord could have gotten all of this with a blink of an eye, yeah. right? Yes. I mean, he could have had pleasure this life. I mean, he created the universe, yeah. but he sacrificed everything for you and me. Thank you, Lord. He shed every single blood. He had to go through the most painful death. Yes so that we could have eternal life. And our life, Christian, we're in danger of living a wicked, unfruitful, you know, failed Christian life. Why? Because of distractions. Yes. You have to prioritize your spiritual growth over everything else. Amen. I mean, again, once you do that, you know, we always talk about balance. Rest will come along. You're doing best for the Lord. How are you not going to do best for everything else, right? Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Think about it. If you're doing best for the Lord, whatever you're doing, 
wherever you're doing and whatever you're doing, right? You got to do it as if you're doing it to the Lord. Amen. Then you don't even have to worry about, oh, I'm spending too much time at church. I'm spending, you know, too much time on the street. You know, sometimes my, I lose my voice because I preach too hard. Oh. I'd rather lose my voice preaching out on the street than screaming at a, you know, stupid sports team, right? Yeah. That's what everybody does, right? Amen. You know, you scream for your sports team, and when they lose, your life is over. <laughs> I'm telling you because I went through it one time. Like, what? They don't feed me, right? Yeah. They don't pay my salary, no. right? They don't do anything for me. They're just an entertainment. Yes. And you're rude to your family, you're rude to your wife, rude to your husband, rude to your children, you're cranky because a sports team lost? I mean, what are they to you, right? Do they ever get you closer to the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, no. That's obviously not. Yeah. Because when they lose, when your, your demeanor changes, joy disappears, right? Yes. But when they win, this fake joy comes in, stays there for a very few moments. Because next game they lose, you're down again, right? Next season they come, they don't do well. I don't care if they were champions last year, you're down again. Nobody ever wins all the time, yeah. right? So you have to expect that. Then think about all the distractions in your life that has put Lord Jesus Christ number two, three, four, five, like bottom of the packing order. You have to confess your sins. You have to go to the Lord that you put other things above him. Because if you don't get rid of all your distractions in life that's stopping you from getting close to Lord Jesus Christ, you'll never get out of the danger. Think about it. How easy for you to fall into temptation if your mind is all about wealth, right? Someone might offer you a job on a Sunday. You know what? You only have to come to Sunday work once a month and I will triple your salary. And you're struggling financially right now, and you need that money, right? But you don't trust in the Lord to fulfill his promise. So what happens? It's very easy for you to fall into that temptation. Yeah. And don't say, I won't do it, because you and I could fall into it all the time. Yes. Man, especially, you know, you see your children, you know, struggling to eat on a daily basis. Yes. They don't have the clothes that you want them to have. Again, it's not what they need. You want them to have it, right? right. And then you start comparing everything about you, your wife, your husband, your children, every part of your life to other folks, you know, who live in a better zip code, right? Yeah. Or technically because they have a higher income. Man, when those temptations come because of these distractions, you're going to say yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And don't ever say, I'll never say no. Right. I mean, I'll never say uh, whatever it is, right? I'll never say yes to those temptations when they come my way. Yeah? You always will say yes. Those are the people who always say yes, right? You know, I'm going to die for the Lord right now. Man, when, right. and the Lord tests you right away. And then you're like that chicken, you know, hiding back over there in the corner. Yes. You know, total darkness, right? That's why you have to really... Examine yourself if distractions have become your biggest danger in Christian life. And second point, going after, distract, after distraction naturally becomes doubt. Your doubts have made you, you know, Christians in danger. You have no faith anymore. Right? Faith is believing in things that you can't see. Right? But... Because you're in such a mess. A lot of times, doubting people are people who are in their sin, right? Yes. Sinful people always doubt. And doubt can creep in your heart very slowly, you know? Again, I mentioned a lot of things, right? But we look at pleasures and riches mainly and the cares of this world. I'm telling you, if you, for example, relationship sense, right? If you are faithful, and then if it's Lord's will that you meet a 
you know, good Christian young man and woman, it's going to happen, right? You don't have to doubt that it's not going to happen, so you make these rash decisions, right? I'm like, oh, you know, I'm getting up there in my age, you know? I'm only 25, you know? I better get married, you know, before people start laboring me, you know? You're too old. So you make, like, some hasty decision. You go to, uh, hopefully our kids don't do it. You go to this Christian online dot com dating site and then with all the fake pictures out there yes. and the fake job profiles out there right. oh yeah this is johnny be good you know okay graduated from some ivy league you know can have a good job all right and he said he's a christian fake. yeah you know, or like you're going to you know jane doe oh wow you know She's just pretty. I mean, guys don't really care about anything right now. They're like, man, she's pretty, you know? Yeah. So, you know, looks matter. So, and then before you know it, you know, you're like, okay, I'm going to meet that person. And they don't even look like the picture. They're like, you know what? But, you know, I have my <laughs> reputation. So I'm, I'm just going to go with it. And then you marry, you know, they turn out to be an unbeliever. And then what happens? You know, your life is a hot mess. Yes, right. like, it's not like you could just quickly say, I'm just going to divorce, right? It's, it's your mess. You know, you got to be accountable for your mess. Yes. So that's why be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, right? That's what the Bible says. But once doubts start creeping in, that's just one example. You're just going to commit this terrible sin that you're going to regret for the rest of your life. And another doubt is what? As we talk about the riches of this world, your finance situation, right? It's tough. I mean, we live in this day and age where, you know, everything's so expensive, inflation. Yeah. And don't tell me as Christians, you don't feel it, right? You know, I, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm Apostle Paul. I don't need anything. You know, I just need the word of God and I'm going to be out there and preach, right? You know, you're not, right? You know, you have cares of this world that you do have to take care of. Yeah. Especially if you're head of the household, you know, as a man, you have to work. Amen. Right? Yes. You can't be doubting Thomas in this case. Lord, you know, I can't do my best because my back hurts today. I just slept wrong. You know, my shoulder's hurting today. Lord, I, you know, I have no job, but... You know, I had my Bible, you know, on my pillow last night. I slept with it. So I know someone's going to call me today. You know, I know they're going to give me a director's job with seven-figure search time and salary, right? <laughs> you know, or high six-figure. Man, I don't know what dreams you have, right? That should only be your, you know, needless dream. Hey. You have to do your best. Yes. You have to work hard. If you don't do your best, you always will have your doubt. As Christians, that's a danger that you have. You always doubt the Lord in any situation, whether it's finance, whether it's, you know, spiritual sense, whether it's relationship sense, even health sense, because you don't do your best. How can you expect the Lord to give you a healthy body? All you do is put junk into your body all the time. True. Right? You're drinking soda, six-pack every single day. I mean, God forbid you're drinking alcohol, right? Yeah. You know, we went through it many, many times, right? You know, God said, don't even look at it. So there's no, you know, Christian drinking out there, okay? I mean, if you want to talk about it, talk to me after church, you know. I'll show you from the Bible. But we're just talking about this, you know, full of sugar stuff, okay? And then you're doubting your health. You drink Coke two liter every single day. And you're like, Lord, why do I have diabetes, you know? <laughs> How come I don't breathe well? You know, you're like, all you're doing is eating, you know, trans fat all the time. God, I can't get rid of my stomach. You don't exercise. You're like, Lord, as I age, I thought, you know, I'm supposed to become more fine age, you know, machine. You're like, no, I mean, <laughs> you have more aches and everything. And you start having this doubt. Is my health ever going to get better? You don't do your part, you always have your doubt. But if you do everything possibly that you can do, you won't have doubt. 
you, you know for sure that you've done your best. Everything's in Lord's hand. And whatever Lord does at that point, who are you to complain, right? Yeah. And you have that strong conviction and boldness. Many people lose boldness and conviction and courage to preach the word of God because they have doubts in their life. You, know, you have a lot of doubts. I mean, when you're preaching the word of God, if you have something bothering you so much, right? Whatever it is, issues of life that's bothering you, whether it's cares, riches, or pleasures of life, then you can. You can live a normal, fine Christian life. But thou will always hold you back. Amen. Think about it. You could jump as high as you want. You could run as high as you want. But if you have doubt that, you know what, my ankle's going to give out, right? If you have doubt that if I run too fast, you know, my heart's going to burn out and I'm going to die. Then would you be able to do it? No. That's majority of the Christians. Majority of the Christians can't do anything for the Lord because they're doubting Thomas. They doubt everything. Why? Because they don't do their best. The solution is you do your best for the Lord, for everything, every part of your life. Whether it's small, whether it's big, you have to do everything as if you're doing it unto the Lord. If you don't, then that danger, that doubt will just come in. And then what happens? So you have a lot of distraction. You're doubting. And third point, what danger you have now as a Christian? Disobedience. You're just going to commit sin left and right. You know? I mean, to obey is better than sacrifice. You know, according to 1 Samuel 15, 22, it's just in your brain only. You know, you don't care about it, anything. You know, you know what? This is sacrifice for my family, Lord, so I have to do it. This is sacrifice for my wife, my husband, so I have to do it. Then a lot of this disobedience comes, why? Because of compromise. Yes. You start compromising everything. You know what? In order for my family to have cares and riches and pleasures of this life, Lord, I have to compromise. And then you justify. You start justifying it. You know, a lot of people are disobedient. They justify everything. Why do people hate lawyers? They justify all the sins of the world. I mean, this guy just killed and murdered someone, and you're saying they're innocent. Okay, you see your job? Okay, but you're a liar. I mean, this guy, you know, bankrupt the whole company. You're like, no. They had inside information, everything. No, you know. Ask Martha Stewart, you know, I mean, everybody, right? I mean, they all think that <laughs> as long as you have a good reason, it's okay. I mean, are you like that kind of Christian? You're in that danger, in that danger of disobedience when you think that it's okay. I mean, I had to do it, you know. Lord will understand. Really? Lord is holy God. Yes. But when you think about lore and love, you also should think about lore and fire. Yes. Our God is consuming fire. He sends people to hell for eternity. Yes. He's jealous God. Amen. That's the type of God we believe in. He showed his love at Calvary. Thank you, Lord. John 3.16. He did everything he needed to do. Rest of him, he has to be just. No matter what. Yes. So many dangers that Christians like you and I have is we fall into this disobedience. And let's go back to First Thessalonians chapter 5. We memorize it. We say it all the time. Why? Because we don't do a couple things. Let's look at verse 21. Let's look at verse 21. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, Bible says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. You and I don't prove all things anymore. You know, when it comes to any issues of life, you don't go to the Word of God. How are you going to prove all things? You only prove all things through the Word of God. King James Bible. Amen. I mean, if every single Christian held on to King James Bible and proved everything in their life, went to King James Bible for every issue of their life, they won't be as disobedient like right now, right? Amen. Only reason 
we do have King James Bible by God's grace and mercy and through Dr. Ruckman holding fast, right? Proving all things. I mean, he had King James Bible, NASB, NIV, every other satanic Bible. Prove that King James Bible is the perfect word of God. Every other Bible is devil's Bible. Yes. Coming from the Catholic Bible lineage, Amen. right? You and I have to go to the Word of God more often. We don't do it enough. No. Okay? Sometimes, answers obvious. And Word of God will give you strength and conviction, encouragement to go through. Yes. But you don't go. Instead, you, instead of choosing the Bible, you choose disobedience. Right? How many times do you think you could have avoided disobedience to God in your life? if you just went to the Word of God instead of what you were doing. Many. Right? So, common example is your phone. Cell phone. Yes. Man, it could do a lot of damage to human being, right? Yes. With a click a button, right? A lot of, you know, wicked pictures are in there, videos are in there, a lot of wicked stuff, period. Yes. So when you encounter those things, what do you do usually? Do you drop it and go to the Word of God? Or do you actually go through the whole thing? Again, once you start debating with the temptation, you already start committing sin. Right? If we were to take away your cell phone, is your life over? For many people it is. Oh, I can't live without my phone. I, mean, I could still tell you, I'm old enough to live in an age where there were no cell phones. We, work, we live with the pager. And that was a huge advancement. You know, phone booth was our best friend. Yeah. You know, we always go to the phone booth, always carry some change, right? <laughs> and then nowadays you ask these kids, what's a phone booth? You know, they just think of it as a little toy, you know, from 1950s, right? No, that only happened like in the 1990s. Right. You know, in the 2000s and everything accelerated. So you have to look at yourself. Am I proving all things? You have to be a discerner as a Christian. Amen. You can't just take it for granted. You can't just go with what the media says or he says, she says. You can't even go with what I just say, right? You got to go to the Word of God and prove out things. And then what happens? Verse 22 becomes a lot easier for you. Abstain from all appearance of evil. How do you avoid danger? Avoid it once and for all. How do you miss danger? Avoid it. How do you get away from danger? Avoid it. Abstain from all appearance of evil. We walk to danger. That's the problem as Christian. So if that grand piano is the sin that has haunted you, made you commit sin ever since you got saved, because everyone has certain type of sin that's always got a hold of you, and then you know it. <laughs> you avoided it for like last five years. Man, man, you're going through a hard time. You have so much distraction. Now you're dieting, doubting, right? And like, you know it's there. That's the hardest part. When it comes to disobedience, it's not something new. It's something that's there. And devil knows how to get you. Devil could be dormant. You know what? I'll play with you a little bit. You know what? I'll give you a reprieve for one, two, three, four, a few years. But you know what? I know when to strike you. Like that viper strikes, yeah. you know, at a no, I mean, suddenly it strikes. And suddenly your life situation needs that thing, needs that grand piano, that sin. How would you resolve that? You have to abstain from it, right? Yes. Prove. If you have so much doubt, go to the Word of God. Okay, no good. And you have to walk away. Amen. But what do Christians usually do? You have to go through it. And then you have to touch it. But you don't finish with touching, do you? You have to play it. You have to hear how did it sound before, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's how it sounded before. And then, oh, one note is not enough. You know, I have to do like all the notes, right? And then you go through do, re, mi, pa, sol, la, ti, do, plus, you know, next high level and stuff. And then what happens? You go through the fullness of that sin. Yes. And then your life, Galatians 6, 7, and 8, comes to you. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. 
whatsoever man soweth, thou shall he also reap. Man, then you fell into that danger, and then you made your life a mess. Sowing is easy, but reaping is so hard. Yes. Ask anybody. Ask your own life. Ask yourself in the mirror. When you're reaping all the disobedience that you've done to the Lord, man, that's tough. And it's still ongoing for a lot of us, right? Yes. And it will go on for a lot of you and me until the Lord comes back. Yes. But we have chance to get right with the Lord. We have chance to lessen that fruit. If that sin, grand piano, 10 seed, right? Then that 10 seed will bear fruit. And we finish its bearing fruit, it's done, right? Yes. No more bad fruit. But if you go there and commit that sin again, you're adding more seed. And it becomes never-ending cycle. Man, with certain sins in your life, because your disobedience is like that middle name, right? It's like John, example, John Drug Jones. John Alcohol Smith, right? Blah, blah, blah. And then it's part of your middle name. It's stuck there. It's time for you to get rid of it once and for all. Yes. It should be John Holy Jones. Amen. You know, John Holy Smith. That's it. You got to replace all this disobedience with holiness. Amen. Because God said you need to be holy. Be holy for I am holy. So as I conclude, think about your Christian life. You are facing a lot of dangers. And especially distractions and doubts and disobediences in your life. What are you going to do about it? Solution is simple, right? You get right with the Lord. You confess your sins. You abstain from it. And you prove all things. Is that what you're going to do? That's the real question. You and I know the answers. Are you going to accept those answers? You and I know what to do. We're not going to be just hearers only. We're going to be doers as well. So are you going to be the doers that avoid and reject and, you know what, abhor those dangers? Yes. Or are you going to be that Christian, majority of the Christian, who's going to continue to accept it, live life through it, and then strive to pursue what? Cares and riches and pleasures of this life. What is most important to you? I'll finish with this, you know, illustration. We all want Lord to come back. Amen. Right? Amen. We all know that Lord's going to come back. Yes. According to the word of God. But there are two types of people. And I know, I mean, I, I have listeners, you know, who complain about I'm using too much of a cookie jar illustration in the past. Okay? So I haven't done it for a long time. So, I, you know, give me liberty to do it today. Right? <laughs> in order to get out of danger... In order to be that Christian Lord wants you to be, in order to be that Christian who prioritizes spiritual growth and relation with Lord Jesus Christ, number one, you have to be looking for Lord to come back. Yes. So if a child, so I'm that child, and the mommy goes, okay, okay, Jimmy, do not eat that cookie, okay? You know I'm coming back. If I catch you, you're going to be in big trouble, you know? The bell's waiting for you. So you have the cookie jar there. And then mommy left. And then your calculation is, okay, mommy coming back, but you know what? Mommy got some chores to do. She's got to buy some stuff. So she'll be back in a two hour. That's, that's my calculation. Two hours, right now it's 10 a.m. She'll be back around 12 p.m. So she won't be back before 11, right? So, okay. I know she's coming back, but I don't look for her to come back. Because when she, when she comes back, I can't do my sin, you know. So I'm eating my cookie now, you know. It may taste so good. It never tasted better. But suddenly, doorknob's moving. And unfortunately, cookie jar is right in front of the doorknob where the dinner table is. And then she comes in. And I look her in the eye. My hand is there. And I have another cookie in my mouth. Like, okay, man, I'm done, you know. Yeah. I, I can't go on. I mean, tonight's going to be a hard night for me, or rest of the month, right? 
So when I look at myself, I wasn't looking for her to come back. I knew she's coming back, but I wasn't looking for her. Yeah. If I was looking for her, I would never have touched the cookie jar. Yes. I would have stayed far away from it. As Christians, you got to stay far away from your sins of cookie jar. Amen. When you look for the Lord to come back at any moment, you're going to be away from those dangers. Yeah. Lord's going to open the door at any moment. I want to be found a faithful servant. Absolutely. I don't want to be found unfaithful servant. You know what? If this is the cookie jar, I'm going to throw it away, as far away from me. Yes. You know, because that's really Help bad, me, right? So, in conclusion, are you going to be that Christian looking for the Lord to come back? Or are you going to be that Christian who just knows the Lord's coming back, but living in your sin? And when he finds you, you're going to be caught with your hands in your cookie jar. Let's pray. Dear Father, there are many dangers out there for Christians, Lord. And we oftentimes neglect it. We oftentimes, we just compromise our ways. And we let these distractions of this world just rule and take over our life. Lord God, help us get right with you. If there were any distractions, if there are any doubts and our disobedience have gotten in the way of having a right relationship with you, Lord God, help us to just confess our sins and get right with you, Lord. Help us to start over. Help us live as holy a life as you want us to live. And help us to be looking for you to come back. And that would definitely change our walk, Lord. Help us to be that Christian who stays away from those dangers and rise above those dangers and grow spiritually and get right with you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.